And that's the, the earliest ideas then about the motion of electrons and all that. They were particles being bent by forces generated by field. This is now all passe. Instead of that, it's just the exchange of electrons, exchange of photons between the electron or between the nucleus and the electron, the amplitudes for which are all given by this little constant, and the amplitude for the photon to move is given by a known function and the electron likewise. And that's all there is to it, and from it all the rest of the laws of physics come out. Another example is the scattering of light. Light, according to that view, would always go in a vacuum in a straight line or however it goes in a vacuum. And if the, the distance is a big, it would look like a straight line. But we know that we talked many times about light being bounced and reflected from the surface or light going slower in materials and so on. I have to explain that. What's involved there is that in matter, there are electrons. And if this is a typical electron, moving along, again, time is this way, unlike this diagram. This is an ordinary diagram moving through a piece of material. They're moving through some place. And here's time again in space. We can have a photon coming in from the outside, hitting an electron in an atom, say, or anywhere. And after that, a photon is emitted by the system. So a photon comes in and a photon goes out. And it's even possible that the electron condition that was before is restored again, although temporarily it's been changed. Of course, another, if you like this game, you can imagine another diagram. Let's see. Another possibility. Crazy idea, isn't it? That it's emitted before it's absorbed. Yes, you add that too, both together, and it comes out light. Don't worry about anything. You just add everything. <laughs> it's only the sum of these two, which is the right answer, for the scattering of light. So you see that when we have electrons present, a photon can come in and come out in some other direction. And that is the basis of our, the rules that we made before. And I should, uh, for completeness, repeat these rules and explain them all over again. Because in this system, I had a different rule. I talked about photons having an angle dependent on time, and everything was kind of funny, and it doesn't look like it here. So I have to explain that just a little bit. It works more detailed. Now, this is a more detailed description of what happens in here. First. We were supposing that we had monochromatic light, that is, light of one color. That means that the source is emitting light of only one color. How does it do that? The way it does that, what that corresponds to, a source emitting light of one color, is this. A source, this is time again, and this is space. And let's say the source is standing here. It's like this. It might have emitted the photon then. Might have emitted it later, might have emitted it later, might have emitted it later. The amplitude to emit it at each time is different. So the amplitude to emit the photon at different times from the source is changing. It's going around backwards, yes, backwards, like so. Now, to make a quick idea of it, let us suppose, for simplicity, that this function for the photon, just for simplicity, only, but it's right at long distances, only collects, connects two points which are going at the speed of light. It's a simple model. It's a simple approximation. So if I were to come over here and get the photon, if I would get the photon to get to here by one route and compare it to another route, when the time is longer, it must have been emitted earlier. If I asked for it to arrive here at a certain time, if it came this way, it was emitted at one time. If it came this way, it was emitted at another time. The amplitude to be emitted earlier. Wait a minute. It's going around backwards with time. Yes, so the amplitude to be emitted earlier has a lot bigger angle. That's why the one that takes longer has the bigger angle. It's not really a property of the photon in the space, like I cheated you in making believe it was. It's really the amplitude of emitting. If you get the photon at a certain time here, 
it means that it's left here earlier. If it was this long root, it left even further earlier. And if this source was emitting uh, with an amplitude which is changing in time, then the amplitude to arrive here by this root and by the long root are different because the source is different. So it's really due to the source that there's a difference in the phase or the angle, rather, of arrival of the light. In addition, there's one other thing wrong. I talk about light being reflected from a surface, and that's just nonsense. It's not reflected from a surface at all. What it really is, it's, it's scattered by the electrons in the material. So the correct picture of this thing is this. I'll draw a better picture. What really happens is that the light comes down and hits the first piece of matter, and then is scattered back by that kind of a picture on the last board over there, down here, in microscopic view. Or it comes down here, and it's scattered there. Or down here, and it's scattered there. That's all it's done. All it's really scattered in the inside, not on the surface. And so we have to add together a whole lot of amplitudes each of which takes a little longer and it comes from the source at a different time. And so it ends up adding a whole lot of little arrows. Each one is a little turned relative to the other by about the same amount. And if you add arrows, each one of which is the same length, and they're turned relative to one another, you go around on a polygon, or if the arrows are very small, a circle. And so you see that the net result, for example, of a certain thickness is to have an arrow, a net arrow, from this end to here. By the way, if this is the center of the circle, that could be represented as a resultant from these two as this and this together. But I, that's the way I cheated last time. I just drew these two. But what really was happening was the circle. Let me explain it again. It goes, each little contribution in the interior goes around in a circle. And if I have the thickness just right, exactly right, the circle is complete. And the net result is zero. That's the first minimum. If I go a little thicker, I go around again and comes back to zero. If I use the half as thickness, it would go around halfway and stop. And in that case, I get the biggest possible amplitude. And so on. So those fluctuations were really not from the surfaces, but from the interior. At least we have the glass where the matter is doing the scattering of the light and not some imaginary stuff, stuff like the surface. I uh, cannot resist. One of my problems is, uh, the problem is with this is that I, I can